Uh, hi, and welcome to Nothing is Rocket Science, um, a, po- a science podcast where we discuss the nuances of science behind everything. Um, in today's uh, episode, we have a very interesting uh, guest. Uh, we have uh, Ashok with us. Uh, Ashok, is, um, his, in- his introduction is pretty interesting too, because you know he's quite versatile. Um, Ashok is not a chef, but he cooks regularly. Um, he's not a scientist, but he can explain science with easy to understand clarity. He trained to be an electronic engineer, but he is now a software engineer. And uh, he learned to cook from uh, the women in his family who can make perfect fluffy idli without lecturing people on lactobacilli and pH levels. Um, He likes the scientific method, not because it offers him the ability to bully people with knowledge, but because it confidently lets him say, I don't know, let me test it out uh, by myself. So, um, you know, I think this is like a perfect way to uh, learn anything that is scientific. Um, When he's not cooking, he's usually playing uh, music on his violin, um, jello um, and guitar. Uh, He also has his uh, page on uh, SoundCloud, which I'll be putting all the details in the the description. Um, He also uh, writes illustrated columns on food science for Mint Lounge. Um, Besides that, he's an avid Twitterati and a humorist. So welcome to the podcast, um, Ashok. Uh, it's it's thank you for uh, making time for this. Hey, thank you. Thanks, pleasure. So before I start off with this, um, I thought we have a common ground where I can ask this question: Is cooking rocket science? <laughs> I was just about to say that, you know, one of the first people you should actually interview for your channel is a rocket scientist here. That'll be the perfect way to start a podcast title, you know, is it rocket science? But um, cooking uh, is not rocket science, clearly. Uh, mm-hmm. Some, If you're an industrial food scientist uh, and you're crafting a very delicate, uh, complex snack with multiple flavors and you need to industrially produce it so that they all taste the same. Uh, so indeed, I would I would actually argue making a potato chip like a Pringles or something like that is indeed pretty pretty close to rocket science. Uh, right. But cooking at home uh, is is really a simple craft, uh, and that's really what it needs to be. Right, that's that was one of the questions that I wanted you to actually uh, elucidate. But before that, on a lighter note, uh, I have friends who are engineers, and uh, they often joke that. You know, they found their calling when they were studying engineering or after they finished engineering. So was that the same uh, thing with you? Like, did you, was, is cooking your calling or is music your calling? And, uh, you know, what made you write this book? So um, incidentally, sort of, I grew up in a, a slightly strange family. My, my mother's side are all musicians, dancers. They're either oh. musicians and dancers or priests. So there's like no, okay. there's no in-between range. My father's right. side is a very weird bunch of people who are all over the place. Uh, so... You know, one side is from sort of uh, uh, Tirunelveli. So obviously the more crazy people are from Tirunelveli. Then the more traditional folks are from the Tanjore. That's my mother's side. Right? Uh, and, and clearly, I think, uh, so I grew up sort of uh, with my mother's side, expecting me to be a musician. Uh, you know, I sort of uh, started learning violin early uh, from the Lalgudi school and all of that. So, the, so they expected me to become a professional violinist. In, in fact, uh, I, I learned violin from T.N. Krishnan towards the, so when I was pretty much uh, sort of, you know, in my teenage years. And uh, uh, he, in fact, said, you know, you should quit your engineering and just sort of come up, uh, up you know, come and do this full time. That was when my father made this decision that, no, you know what? No, you keep that as a passion. You don't take it as a uh, uh, sort of a profession. Not everybody becomes successful in music. Only a tiny number become really successful. So mm-hmm. in, a, in a weird way, what he was actually saying is that there are careers uh, where there is a wider room for tolerance for mediocrity and music is not one of them. So that's es- mm-hmm. essentially what he meant in that sense. Uh, but I think, uh, so that was one side of the, the story. The cooking side actually comes obviously from, uh, again, uh, uh, my mother's uh, uh, sort of side, my father's side. Well, you know, they largely sort of lived in these giant uh, you know, uh, joint families. Uh, in fact, the common, this thing used to be that the my paternal grandmother was a bad cook because the, she only knew how to cook for 20 people, not for two people. So okay. the salt and all of that, you know, would be much harder to, sort of manage and so whereas my mother said they were, they've always been urbanites right so they're both traditional but they've always been urbanites my father said is actually from a very tiny village uh, mm-hmm. and so the interesting thing is that uh, I think you know my grandmother grand aunts and everyone else you know were the first people I uh, I learned cooking from uh, and a sense that you know since we were three boys uh, in the house that my mother had a working so she was working and, and sometimes traveling so yeah. as soon as she could trust that I would not cause an LPG explosion in the kitchen, she said, fine, you need to learn to know how to cook. And that was about, you know, 13 or 14 years old. So that I could at least sort of make, you know, rice and rasam and, you know, some potato fry, right? So in, in case she's trying. Right. Uh, 
and then it was only when I went abroad, obviously, yes, after engineering, joined, you know, IT and then uh, went abroad is when I really said, okay, you know what, I think I need to learn more than just, you know, rasam and uh, rice, I need to sort of pick up a few more skills. So I uh, sort of met all my relatives, all old people, whoever I, you know, sort of knew. And they said, give me your recipes, you know, let me write it down. And in some sense, actually, the, the, the seed of the book, I would actually argue started there because and I clearly realized a lot of these a lot of these really great cooks didn't think in terms of terms of recipes. Uh, right. They thought in terms of heuristics. So you know, I was insistent. Tell me, is it quarter teaspoon or half teaspoon? She said, I have no clue. You you put it and you smell it and you figure out what's the right amount, right? Uh, in bigger ratios, they were thinking in terms of uh, observational uh, sort of you know feedback, continuous feedback as opposed to a linear set of methods that you just blindly follow, right? Uh, in fact, uh, they they were a lot less worried about the authenticity of a recipe than younger people seem to be, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And in that sense, I think, you know, uh, it was always in my mind that I think we're doing Indian cooking uh, sort of a grave injustice uh, by by very poor documentation, by documentation via recipes. Uh, and uh, in fact, I often give one example, a, a very common recipe instruction in many recipes on the internet is, you know, cook the tamarind till the raw smell is gone. That's one of the worst instructions ever. Uh, it makes absolutely mm -hmm. no sense because how do you communicate the smell of a tamarind, right? One to someone who's planning to cook it and does not know what it smells like. And more importantly, how do I distinguish between the raw smell and the not raw smell of tamarind, right? right. So in the sense that I think a better instruction would have been cook the tamarind till it tastes as less sour as you like it, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I, if I was a food scientist, I'd say cook the tamarind till the pH reaches 4.5 because you know 4.5 to 5 is considered to be the range That's for tasty good. food. Uh, right? Right. And so, on. so in that sense, uh, what I felt that I think uh, the lot of the whys were being missed out, uh, right? So, a lot of great cooks they have the tacit knowledge, they have the tacit wisdom. Uh, they they may not be able to explain it with chemistry or physics or thermodynamics, uh, but you know, let's be absolutely sure. In, in in the kitchen, it's the cooking knowledge that counts, not the science knowledge. The science knowledge right. is only useful from the point of view of being able to transmit that knowledge to the next generation with better fidelity um, and in a more verifiable, you know, testable way, right? Uh, in, in that sense, you know, if, if traditionalists actually want to make sure that their traditional wisdom is passed on, they better make friends with science rather than, you know, treat it as some, some kind of enemy, right? Uh, so I think, you know, that was the thought process. But then, you know, I was doing too many other things. I was continuing to do music. I was writing, I was traveling. So I never really got down to writing uh, this book that I wanted to write for, for a long while. And then uh, uh, Penguin kept, you know, knocking on my door for the last five years and saying, no, you really need to write this. You really need to write this. And then when the pandemic right. hit, they said, well, it's now or never. This is the time. I mean, tons right. of, you know, young people are learning to cook. This is the manual, you know, you need to give them. And so, you know, so that's when the sort of book came about. Right. That's interesting. Um, and I think to touch upon what you just said, uh, I think you beautifully described uh, the art and craft of cooking. Um, like, you know, when I first started reading, I didn't quite understand the diff. Like, you know, I mean, I know that, literal meaning of art and craft, but uh, I didn't realize the difference between that, um, especially when applied to cooking. So can you, you know, tell us what is the difference between the art yeah. of cooking and the craft of cooking? So I think the easiest way to understand um, the distinction between art and craft is actually to perhaps take music as an example. Uh, that a vocalist or, or a performer uh, can and really sort of, you know, uh, be one with the audience uh, and be able to sort of improvise on a phrase just exactly at that right moment and sort of make that audience go, oh, wow, amazing, right? So that is art. Right? Uh, there, is no, there is no science to it. There is, there is, it. It's a very deeply human, it comes out of empathy, it comes out of a very oneness uh, and with, with the audience and really understanding you know, what you're doing, right? Uh, but that art cannot, you, know, you, cannot, you cannot do that unless it's built on this huge skyscraper of craft, which is essentially 10,000 hours of practice and vocal training, very boring stuff, right? Uh, so in that sense, I think, you know, everything, you know, be it theater, et cetera, somebody may win an Oscar, you know, and so on, but it's the hours and hours of practicing the lines in front of a mirror and getting feedback, and that's the craft, right? So literally everything, there is an art to cooking, and there is, but it's mostly craft, right? So the art is actually thinking creatively about ingredients and co concocting a fantastic sort of beautiful looking dish in a Michelin star restaurant or, or for that matter, you know, so, you know, so somebody like say a Mountbatten money in Chennai concocting this whole watermelon or a pineapple rasam. Uh, and, and that's, oh, that's a genius recipe. And, and so oh, that there is art to actually thinking about cooking that way. Uh, right. But the craft is essentially all the small little things that you need to do. Uh, get the salt right, get the balance right, uh, make sure you don't burn it, uh, make sure it's not too sour. All of that is craft, 
right? So there is, you know, I think, you know, in some sense, you know, we even in IT terms, uh, uh, development of code is art, and then you know, maintenance is craft. Um, mm-hmm. And I think, and that's most of it. Uh, and so I think, you know, that's in some sense the sort of distinction. And cooking home daily uh, right. is is cannot be an art. So we actually we end up calling it an art for very bizarre reasons. Um, it's a, it's almost an excuse uh, for for men to not take it up. Oh, only women can do it. Some grandmothers have it that kai madam in their hands and all of that. So uh, you know, and and everything has to be cooked fresh and it is an art, right? So uh, and it doesn't really sort of do that justice. Uh, it is backbreaking labor that you have to do two to three times a day, and so therefore. Craft essentially makes you think about optimization, makes you think about shortcuts, makes you think about you know use of appliances and modernization constantly. Right? Art right. is something you know something more sort of uh, subtle, something more ethereal, and so on. Mistake. I think in the context of home cooking, we should not be uh, worrying too much about the art at all. Yeah, right. You know, so it's just uh, yeah. What you say is uh, right uh, because in terms of the scientific uh, aspects. You know, here, uh, you know, we have our, uh, you know, center near Piney and every, on a daily basis, I cook for about 20 people, as, as you said, on your uh, maternal grandmother's side. And then it so happens that when I induct people into the cooking process, what at least I've observed is that is in terms of uh, people uh, who are sort of intuitively learning, they pick it up in a certain way. But especially I've seen when men try to pick it up, they need those precise measurements in terms of, uh, should I put like, as you said, you know, one and a half spoons or what is the size of the spoon? At least I didn't have so many questions when I was uh, you know, cooking because it was a process of experimentation and then uh, discovering uh, through that. But when there is no handholding available, I feel that such a manual really helps sure. because um, most uh, that process of what you call it, uh, you know, apprenticeship or uh, internship or, that is not available. Right. Then these precise uh, instructions become quite uh, useful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Otherwise, they would just joke. You know, they did not write that you need to switch on the gas stove, and then. Yeah. Right. Exactly. In fact, the point about apprenticeship is important because uh, historically, the way people learn to cook is, is, for most part, it was just daughters learning from their mothers. Literally, that was that was the, it was an apprenticeship model for most part, right? And you learn by observation. You learn the heuristics. You don't necessarily learn, you know, precise written down instructions but we are now living at a time where more young people are living by themselves uh, and right. we're in in urban and in fact i would actually argue it's pretty much the first time that this many number of indians are living and cooking for themselves as opposed to cooking for others you know cooking mm-hmm. in india is meant to be purely a social task in the sense that you always do it for someone else you never do it for yourself because you're never alone right so children live with their parents and then they immediately marry and they, there's literally no phase where they're actually living for long periods of time just by themselves and having to cook for themselves. And that's only happening now in this generation. So I think it's in some sense also new, uh, purely from a social standpoint as well. Interesting. Um, Coming to the science, like, um, you know, you were talking about the concept of, we've had like, um, I mean, I think India, uh, like other countries, we've had a lot of uh, recipe books and, uh, you know, we've had some really famous uh, chefs and uh, cooks, you know, who've um, like starting from, my mom uh, keeps telling me about uh, Meenakshi Ammal where, you know, she follows those yes. traditional cooking and uh, yes. we have Tarla Dalal and, you know, uh, uh, then we have Vikas Khanna, a lot of them. Uh, but um, you introduce a concept of um, food science, which you said, you know, the West follows it and, you know, Indians have to pick up, uh, understand, you know, the, the food science. So what exactly is that and how was that different from a recipe? It is so essentially the, the idea of uh, uh, you can still, by the way, write a recipe um, in scientifically accurate uh, form. Right? So that's my point, right? In the sense that uh, I, I, I'll actually give you an example. Uh, there's a uh, actually, sh- shall I share my screen? I just wanted to show oh, yeah, you. This yeah, yeah. Recipe. Yes, so yes. yeah, yeah. So let me um, just do that, right? Um, so let me actually show you this briefly. Uh, and I wanted to sort of take this as an example, right? I'm not sure if you're seeing my screen now. Yeah. So this is actually a, a recipe I found on the internet. Actually, it's it's number one or two on the Google results. Okay. So clearly, I think millions of people are you know following this recipe. It's it's right. for a very common North Indian dish, dal makhani, uh, mm-hmm. and so on. And again, it's it's also a very time-consuming, laborious dish because black urad dal takes a lot of time. You have to soak, you have to uh, pressure cook, and, and and do lots of those things. Now, um, and this is a very widely respected, widely consumed 
bit of knowledge and I, and i would argue that very influential right in the sense that the recipe writers have a larger audience than science communicators and scientists do right uh, and so here's here's it. look at you know step numbers 8 and 9 now the average person reading this recipe will go yeah fine i think you know i'm just going to read it uh, i'm going to do that and apparently the reason is because the dal will absorb the flavor and turn stick right and number 9 is that to get a creamy texture you add fresh cream uh, and you know and, and so on. so most people will think okay this is fine exactly so my problem is this okay. imagine two or three generations from now uh somebody would read this and go oh okay so if i actually boil something in a in in spices in a gravy filled with spices for a certain amount of time it will absorb flavor it turns out that that's the wrong reason yes you must boil it for 15 minutes and yes in 15 minutes the dal will turn thick but not for the reasons you mentioned for the, the it will turn thick because it will dehydrate the water will evaporate and the whole thing will become thicker that is really the the simple science reason behind why the thickening happens okay the second thing is that basically any kind of plant matter and meat right be it you know plant cells or animal cells muscle tissue and so on do not absorb things from the outside it can only absorb salt let's be absolutely clear because if we could absorb things we would be we would be dead large molecules cannot penetrate into plant cell walls they cannot penetrate into uh cell. you know you know it since we are in the covid pandemic you know the virus needs a very specific lock and key the you know that uh, that that whole receptor you know uh that uh, you know uh, that is required to get into the cell so think about it so and spice flavor molecules are big giant molecules uh they cannot penetrate into so the first really counterintuitive thing that people don't realize flavor does not go inside stuff it's always on the outside okay when you mash okay. it in your mouth you get a feeling that it's coming from the inside because you don't can't tell the difference but yes the only thing that penetrates into plant material and uh, meat material is salt right via osmosis mm-hmm. salt will get into anything so that's essentially how this whole thing works so my point here is that uh, if i have to write a, a a recipe and have that recipe explain the why's uh, the why's have to be i i think scientifically valid because then i think the knowledge is is a lot better represented and it has you know a longer term sort of life uh, if you will right so here's the point the dal does not absorb the flavor actually the gravy gets thicker and because it gets thicker it gets more flavorful because it it's less dilute that's about it the dal just stays exactly as it is the only thing it absorbs is salt from the gravy till it it, it achieves the equilibrium and this is true of anything else right secondly uh, interesting thing is that the creamy texture of of the dal in a in a dal makhani the creamy texture does not come from the creamy one it actually comes from the dal itself the the dal the longer you cook kind of gets really sort of very really really thick uh, and they actually mash it that's what gives it the uniform thick emulsive texture it's not the it's not the cream that you add uh, in fact in punjab they were in many cases they may not even add the cream at all right uh, and so on and it will still be thick so so the point here is is i think uh, i'm not saying you, you should not have recipes but i think there's a way of writing recipes where the whys uh, are grounded in things that are verifiable and testable right now again the, the the trickiness with a lot of this knowledge is that you can follow the instruction and it will work but it will not work for the reason you think it does uh, and you may think it's okay right uh, you know it's it's just like believing in believing the fact that uh, some sort of deity caused the rain you know 2000 years ago uh and now we understand climate science and we understand cloud formation and so therefore there is no deity at this point at least for rain and so on i know i know that fact but i think in 2021 uh, we should not be sort of uh explaining how we cook our food and why the food tastes the way it does using explanations that are not uh, grounded in basic science so that's that i think you know that so that's the sort of example that i wanted to give uh, in this okay. context of why science right yeah mm mm-hmm. so um so so you're saying that uh, the west has already adapted this thing and uh, like you know this is is this how the cookbooks or the recipe books are written in in the west it's it is uh, so clearly i think you know, there are probably a few decades ahead in that sense uh, that's no different from simply the fact that it's the first world they've had uh, more wealth and more privilege and more education for longer than this part of the world they've been kind of catching up much faster right than right, uh, they right. were and so on so that is that um, that said i think you know i again you know i'll sort of go back to a musical example right uh, i i learned both uh, carnatic classical and western classical formally uh in the mm-hmm. in a, in a proper sort of in a, in a training school with with teachers and gurus and so on uh both when i was in the us i i learned the key i learned the piano from uh, uh from you know when i was in texas uh for a couple of years and likewise here uh 
and 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 here's 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 the you know here's the sad observation uh, the pedagogical method of how they document the craft of western music right mm. uh, is just so is 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 just so much better right and the it's reason i'm saying it's better right? Yeah, it is universal. One, the language is universal. It's not exclusionary that I will only teach these people. One, it's documented really, really well. And by the way, so if you if you sort of learn Carnatic music, you'll know that the basics are really basic. And then there is a quantum leap. There's literally nothing in between. But Western music has been documented to grade one, grade two, grade three, grade eight. I mean, it is it is a slow process, um, and it accommodates everyone, um, and it also makes sure that it does not rely on the quality of the teacher at all. You can literally look at material uh, and mm -hmm. just follow those instructions and, and you will get better. So that's what I mean by craft, uh, documenting a craft, right? So I think, you know, the, the distinction here is that we treat Carnatic music only as an art, not as a craft. And the documentation, therefore, as if she says, that I'll teach you some basics beyond which if you have it, you'll get it, right? I mean, I, you know, I can't really go beyond that. So after, you know, you, your initial stuff, you know, you get to that next stuff, it becomes the sudden quantum leap. And if you can't get it, then you drop off, right? Uh, whereas there, no, you can, there's literally, the, the craft is really much, much better documented. So what I'm trying to say, I don't think it's right to say that they're more scientific or anything. Uh, I just think they have a, a better understanding of a craft than art. Uh, and I think they do a phenomenally good job of documenting the craft. Uh, and probably why all of us sort of rush to go study in their universities as opposed to study in universities here. But but it's the same thing, right? Uh, it's just that. Uh, but I think there's an opportunity to do that um, uh, for a, a, a cuisine that is, you know, uh, several orders of magnitude more sophisticated uh, and with, with this sort of rich two, three, 3,000 year old history. Uh, and and again, more flavors and more textures than a lot of, you know, than most cooking in the West, right? So I think in that sense, there's an opportunity to really do that. Uh, for Indian cooking. So I think, you know, that's the distinction here. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I thought we'll, uh, you know, start with, uh, you know, some of the, the most commonly uh, seen or commonly cooked food in India or, you know, around Asia. It's like, you know, uh, the concept of pressure cooking and uh, cooking rice. Um, I thought this was, um, first thing is uh, you've written that, you know, uh, how we measure uh, cooking of rice in terms of whistles. Like, I think that's how I've learned it and that's how my mom taught it. Maybe she understands it better, but I've learned it only as like, oh, okay, yeah. So there's three whistles and then I have to go switch it off. But then it was um, quite good. Like, and uh, when I used other cookers, like you rightly pointed out, um, you know, usually my mom sims it before switching it off. But when I used it on a different stove or, you know, when I used a different cooker, I had to like turn it off. In, you know, I, I didn't need to sim it. So um, can you explain the science behind how a pressure cooker works? And there were some brilliant right. illustrations in your book. And also uh, the whole concept of cooking rice and the ratio, uh, you know, in terms of measurement of water and rice. Yeah, I think it takes right. that. Right. I mean, I would argue that I think, you know, uh, it wasn't too hard to realize that uh, uh, I think the single most fundamental uh, cooking skill, universal cooking skill in Asia is the ability to cook rice. Right. It is the most widely eaten staple food. Uh, uh, and so that's why the, the, essentially the book begins with saying, okay, you need to know how to cook rice, right? right. Um, and I, I, as, a, and a, as a prelude to that, I sort of understand uh, uh, the basic physics of water because uh, you know, we just take water for granted. I mean, it is such a miraculous substance, right? I mean, there's no reason it should be liquid at all, and yet it is. And it's it's because it's a liquid that we are all even alive, uh, and we are you know we are solid matter in that sense. Um, and, and the other thing is that it plays such a tremendous role in cooking because almost everything you cook is mostly water, mm. uh, um, and you know your, all your vegetables, you know, uh, meat, everything, eggs, uh, milk, uh, everything is mostly water. And so if you don't understand the sort of physics of water, uh, so, so that was the reason why we thought, okay, let's start with pressure cooking. Because clearly what it is attempting to do is to, first and foremost, uh, water's fundamental limitation is that it boils, at least at, you know, at, uh, at you know, typical zero as, as, you know, altitude at sea level um, at about 100 Celsius, right? It's, it's, it boils. And so effectively, it, it, it basically reduces your ability to cook anything in water above that temperature, because then it turns to steam. And it sort of escapes from your pot, and you know, unless you have a sealed vessel, it's you can't really cook with steam and so on. Uh, so the uh, so therefore, uh, and the the interesting thing is that most interesting flavor creating reactions happen well above the boiling point of water. So that's another thing. Okay? Mm -hmm. So pressure cooking uh, essentially was invented in the 16th century 
when obviously engineers and scientists realize uh, that at higher pressure water boils at a higher uh, temperature right so it it may boil at 100 but at one bar above uh, atmospheric pressure water boils at uh, 121 celsius right and so uh, the thought process is that hey you know what if i can cook in liquid water at 121 celsius i can cook it faster right i can cook mm. uh, anything faster significantly faster right um and so and therefore i'll be able to save on fuel uh, cooking fuel and so on. so uh, the pressure cooker is in 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 a in a place like asia uh, south asia as well as southeast asia china east asia and so on i mean you know, cost of fuel is is one of the largest components of uh, spend right uh, and therefore you know we are always looking for frugality that space and so the pressure cooker became adapted sort of adopted by this part of the world tremendously actually the west never used pressure cookers till very recently actually so they mm-hmm. they were never bothered they were energy was plentiful right and they were always wary of uh, whether it will explode it sort of feels like a bomb and so on but here you know it's absolutely crucial right so first and foremost essentially a pressure cooker cooks by increasing the boiling point of water to 121 so that it cooks faster so that's number one right uh so the second is the construction of the pressure cooker is such that uh the whistle is essentially a a safety valve Yeah. so what you want to do is that once you build pressure inside uh the pressure cooker you boil water water turns to steam and all of that steam the water vapor is causing extra pressure right um, and it's constantly wanting to expand um, and so at one bar above uh, you you don't want the pressure to increase too much then the whole thing will explode so that's the whole point so there is a safety valve with a weight which is calibrated in such a way that once the pressure goes a little higher then the gravity of that weight that weight will simply move up and release the steam so that's essentially mm-hmm. and you hear that whistle right and it's constructed in such a way so that the you hear the whistle audibly because you want that to be a signal so engineers have sort of right. designed it that way right uh, other it's a quiet release of steam you won't hear it right so that's what okay? right um, and so once it releases the steam the pressure inside goes down and so it pressure builds up again so the realization here is that the uh, the time between whistles it's not a function of cooking at all it's literally a function of how much heat you are applying below if you are applying a mm-hmm. tremendous amount of heat the pressure will build up really really fast right so and it has no impact on the cooking process cooking happens as a result of the amount of time the 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 food is spending in hot water that's really a, a, at at whatever t- at, at the higher the temperature the better right so that's basically what it is right so therefore every pressure cooker's instruction manual actually will tell you this is how to do it but yet people simply just sort of apply the heuristics that they learned from their parents and so on and again it's this classic example of a measuring measuring by whistles works in your home on your cooker on that one stuff which is fine right. which is what most people use and it's fine it's a classic example of a heuristic that is limited on you know exactly your conditions uh and so on. it's not a universal rule if you will right so what mm-hmm. happens is that most manufacturers will tell you after one whistle which means that it has reached pressure now right peak pressure it has yeah. reached one bar extra right you turn on sim and now what the pressure cooker will do is that it will maintain that pressure right without mm-hmm. increasing it uh, you know or lowering it right and that's what you need and then you measure time and so 6 minutes for rice 8 minutes for uh, dal and you know 12 minutes for chana dal and 15 minutes for chana is then are easier ways to then very reliably and consistently cook anywhere using any stuff using any kind of vessel uh, and so on and so that is uh, so that is why you know i think you know the pressure cooker uh, and how to use it is is such a fundamental thing uh, and a lot of young people now are not buying gas stuffs and gas cylinders but they're living by themselves they're getting induction stuffs it's clean easy to clean it's less messy uh, uh, less danger you know don't you know not like leave the gas on and things like that uh, there's no and fire so, you know, and Yeah, exactly. And at two thousand watts, the induction stuff will always result in uncooked rice if you go by three whistles. Right? Mm-hmm. So I think that is uh, that's the reason why this is essentially why pressure cooking is such a in- useful skill to have. Then you can apply it in in so many other uh, situations as well. And uh, you also mentioned how uh, when you cook it on a gas stove with fire, it, it takes this this time. And like you mentioned now that. Uh, when you cook it on a induction stove it takes uh, it takes a longer time uh, to so get less, cooked less so time. what less time so no, induction so, stove is much faster yeah right so why is that what is causing that is it the flow of electricity yeah. the amount of electricity that is yeah. so you think about a uh, uh, gas stove uh, the basic principles are that you know you're burning a fuel um, mm-hmm. which is causing a flame uh, and that flame um, is essentially then hitting the bottom of your metal uh, vessel Uh, and so uh, and that uh, basically exciting the molecules there they are picking up heat uh, so it's basically then heat by conduction right 
so mm-hmm. uh, the 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 molecules the atoms in the the metal are vibrating and they are transferring that energy to the food inside right so that's basically how heating happens in a on a stuff right um heating on an induction stuff is very different um, heating on an induction stuff happens as a result of uh, there being a electromagnetic coil inside the stuff uh which induces uh in a magnetic material like cast iron stainless steel uh, and so on so you can't like cook with like copper or something like that on an induction stuff so it has to be a magnetic mm-hmm. uh, material right? right uh right. so it induces uh, a, an electric field in the uh, in, in inside your this thing and it causes eddy currents to flow in that material and the resistance of that material heats up the uh, heats up the vessel the right so mm-hmm. that's why by the way the surface of your induction cooker does not get hot does not get hot at all actually the, it it feels hot only because the heat of the vessel touching it transfer some heat so they put a ceramic material that's not a great conductor of heat uh, or, or some kind of material on top right mm-hmm. so there is no conduction at all it's the pan the pan is literally heating itself right and so therefore mm-hmm. there is no limit to how much it can heat itself you keep applying inducing that field it will keep heating itself limitlessly whereas in right. the other case you are limited by how much fuel and how much uh, fire and how uh, you are willing to create and the amount of intensity the burner is able to put out right which is usually mm-hmm. in a home kitchen is pretty small so your high also right is is very very small amount of heat compared to say a burner that a restaurant uses right, right, uh, right. which is very high intensity high amount mm-hmm. of heat that it will put out whereas in an induction stove at 2000 watts the pan will endlessly keep heating itself and heat very very rapidly because it's heating not via conduction by literally by currents and resistance in the in the metal itself right so that's why it's much much faster mm, that's interesting so how do um, these technologies impact the uh, the molecules of the food itself uh, you know one is cooking with the pressure cooker versus cooking, uh, cooking in an induction stove versus uh, you know at least i cook uh, in open pot uh, yeah. in terms of using a lid or like uh, without a so the the heat source uh, essentially has no bearing on 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 anything uh, the material of the the vessel itself has some effect uh, depending on what you're cooking like for example uh, if you're using copper if you're using aluminum if you're using uh, certain kinds of uh, metals uh, then and and if what you're cooking has acids like tomatoes tamarind lime juice vinegar what have you uh then that will react with the the metal and actually impart a slightly metallic taste uh to the food so which is why uh they say that if you're using if you're using cast iron uh if it's not well seasoned enough and if you cook tomato or sambar in it it'll taste slightly metallic so uh sort of avoid cast iron at least for uh so on the other hand like for example if you're using like a clay uh earthenware uh sort of this thing uh another sort of thing comes into play because the earthenware is absorbent uh, so as you cook a dish uh, uh, in in an earthenware the pot itself is going to absorb a fair amount of that flavor and then every time you cook it some of a little bit of that sort of uh, flavor is going to come back into the this thing a tiny amount right uh it, and in, in fact actually earthenware pots you know so for example in rural tamil nadu you know or in kerala people will use they will especially use one earthenware pot for cooking fish uh and that pot will literally smell of fish uh, all the time and they will use only that and they believe that it sort of imparts extra flavor and so on so the material has a little bit of an impact but uh, but from a nutrition and other standpoint uh, uh, i think all those claims about oh you should cook on copper or oh, since you should cook on you should not cook on aluminum and all of that is is slightly overblown uh, it matters a lot less uh, statistically it matters very tiny uh, and so i think you, you, your the quality of your ingredient has a bigger role to play whether it's organic non organic than the material and the heat and all the rest of these things okay thanks um and coming back to rice um you know we again we measure rice and water in terms of it's it's usually uh one is to two uh, like one one glass of rice and then yeah. two glasses of water and um and when you increase the quantity of rice we usually you know just double the amount of water uh, so why is that 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 equation doesn't work why is that the, why is doubling the equation why does that yeah. you know not work it's it, so so the ratio heuristic again comes from a misunderstanding of uh, how rice water absorption actually works right the rice ratio heuristic again is a limited heuristic in if you're cooking one cup of rice on that specific vessel of that certain width at your home 
it works. The one is to two actually mostly works as a heuristic. Mm -hmm. It doesn't scale. Uh, it, it will not work in a wider mouthed vessel and so on. So, mm -hmm. uh, so the, because the, the right way to think about uh, rice and water is the fact that a cup of rice absorbs a cup of water for it to for it to be for it to get to the texture that is ideal for steamed rice i mean it, you can continue adding more water and it'll become kanji or it'll become like a porridge uh, right. but optimally one cup of rice one cup of water is what you want the rice to absorb for it mm -hmm. to get to that sort of texture that you like as you know regular steamed rice and this is for all mm -hmm. polished white varieties not brown rice uh, all okay. white rice varieties around the world is a one is to one ratio is what it needs to absorb right now obviously Unfortunately, what happens is that some of the, as you're cooking rice, you're naturally going to have a lot of the water evaporate, right? So, uh, so literally putting one cup of rice in one cup of water, you'll end up with uncooked rice because the water, a fair bit of the water will evaporate, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the important thing here is that the evaporation rate is one, a function of the amount of heat you're putting out and two, the surface area of the vessel. So a narrower vessel, you will lose less water than in a wider vessel. So that's number one, right? Mm -hmm. And so, the right heuristic that our grandmothers used to use is to use an index finger on top of the surface of the rice. You add the rice and then you measure one index finger sort of knuckle uh, and you add water till it reaches that. You're intuitively what you're doing is you're accommodating extra water on top that will evaporate mm. while all the water exactly at the level of the rice and below will be absorbed by the rice. So mm. that's intuitively what you're trying to do and that's the right way to do it. And this way, by the way, it's independent of what vessel you're using, the amount of rice you're using. And so you, so even if you were like three cups of rice, three cups of rice, you put three cups of water, right? Uh, and then you literally add the, the extra that you need Knuckle. on top. Mm. Knuckle is exactly right. So same volume of rice and water so that it gets to exactly the same level. And then you add extra water that's going to evaporate while you're actually cooking, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a, it's a universal heuristic uh, that will work, you know, no matter, you know, where and what rice and, you know, and so on. Right. So that's the way to estimate. That's, that's really interesting. And uh, I also saw that, um, you know, um, you use a lot of temperatures, like, you know, you spoke about 121 degrees and then like 100 and, um, degrees Celsius. So um, can you tell us the significance of the use of temperatures? Because usually we don't see that in any of the recipe books or, you know, in any, any food laws yeah. or something. They don't talk in terms of temperatures. Yes. yes. So I, again, it's a... Uh, Understanding temperature is, uh, and being able to roughly in your mind kind of know what happens at what temperature is, is in my opinion, you know, even if you don't learn any of the other things in the book, if you just learn that one table, uh, it'll make you a better cook. Uh, and I'll, I'll sort of explain why. Uh, so if you look at the things that we cook, right, all the way from, let's sort of, you know, at the lowest end of the spectrum, uh, you know, so, you know, cooking like uh, more red meat, like say, you know, a beef and mutton and chicken and pork and so on. Uh, so sort to white meat, eggs, uh, and then vegetables, uh, rice, uh, and, and all the rest of these things, right? Um, and then you're deep frying, right? So you're sauteing onions, and then you're deep frying. So this is that full spectrum. And then you're baking, which is the, the highest end of the spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if you intuitively understand that starches gelatinize at between 60 and 70 Celsius, 50% mm. right? of our calories come from starches, be it rice, be it wheat, be it millet, be it something, or dal, or dal is 50% carbohydrates, right? It's starch right. Only It's only 50% protein. So a lot of people mm -hmm. think they're getting a ton of protein from that. Yes, it's a great vegetarian source of uh, protein, but you're also getting a ton of carbohydrates. So, you know, it's good to remember that. So what it essentially means is that if you intuitively understand temperatures and you just have a temperature sensor with you, which is really cheap, right? It's literally 100 rupees or something. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, you become a better cook. You have a lot more control, right? So you know exactly at what, what temperature starches are going to get cooked, right? So it's actually key to cooking rice for specialty dishes, like say a pulao uh, or a biryani, where you want the rice to be perfectly separate grained and not stick to each other and so mm -hmm. on. You need to understand this temperature, right? So what actually happens is that you, you want to cook the rice, not over boil it. You want to get it to the point where the starch is gelatinized and instantly lower the temperature because you then want the starches to retrograde, which means that they, they'll start crystallizing and get separate grains. Otherwise, the rice will stick together, right? Otherwise, then you can't make a, like a pulao or a biryani and so on. So therefore, understanding the 60 to 70 is crucial even when you're cooking like specialty rice. But where it's even more tremendously useful in cooking eggs because eggs depending on whether you're cooking at 62 
or 70 in an eight Celsius range, you can get from uh, undercooked to atrociously overboiled. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and with that green sort of thing that comes in between the yolk and the, the white, which is ferrous sulfide, uh, the hydrogen sulfide gas released by, by the whites sort of mixed with the iron inside the yolk to form that green thing, which means you're overcooked yeah. here, right? right? Right. So, mm -hmm. so which therefore means that you need to, uh, if you understand exactly that, you can you can make your egg consistently perfect every time because the, the those proteins will will set and denature exactly at that temperature. So again, if you understand exactly what temp what temperature uh, proteins denature, again it depends on whether it's white or red meat and so on, um, and depends on whether the bones are there or not there and so on. You can really control the texture. Uh, of it is and, and in a lot of Indian uh, cooking the meat ends up being really chewy and overcooked right uh, and which is why we go, go abroad and Indians will don't like eating the meat there because they think it's undercooked the reality mm -hmm. is that protein start denaturing at 50 Celsius right so that's why you can have a rare steak uh, and be completely fine uh, and so on so essentially I think one obviously temperature is clearly one uh, a very crucial aspect and then where it gets really really important is at what temperature do I do I start browning onions mm. in a way that it does not burn right before it actually right. gets brown right mm -hmm. so again if you're sauteing onions 110 to 120 is what you need to be to actually get that browning without it burning okay um, mm -hmm. and then by the way the last and most important thing is that how do I make the perfect puri uh, so that it doesn't get greasy right and mm -hmm. it actually yes. perfectly puffs up and so on your temperature has to be between 175 and 180 right? Anything less, your puri will be greasy. Anything more, the outside will burn before the insides cook. So 175, 180 is the ideal deep frying temperature. And there's and the reason for this is actually quite straightforward. What you want to do when you're deep frying is you want to hit the sweet spot of the outside of the food dehydrating. So right. basically what is deep frying? Deep frying is all water on the surface has to be lost so that it becomes dry, crisp, and importantly, opaque. So, so that it doesn't, you know, fats don't go inside, right? The oil should not go inside. So if it's a low temperature and it's not dehydrating the surface fast enough, the oil will get literally inside and, and your puri will turn greasy. So if it is between 175 and 180, it essentially, the, the outside crisps very quickly. And what you'll often find is that when you put, when you put a puri in oil, right? First thing you will see is that bubbles come up, right? Mm -hmm. So... What are those? So first, first and foremost, remember when you're deep frying, as long as you're seeing bubbles, the temperature is under 100 Celsius on the surface. Why? Mm -hmm. Because water is still liquid and right. it is still evaporating. Once the bubbles stop, it means all surface water is gone. And at this point, the temperature will start shooting from 100 to 180 very, very quickly. That's when browning will happen because the Maillard reaction happens between 110 and 170. That's when the puri gets brown, right? First, it will be white and bubbling. Mm -hmm. Then right. the bubbles will stop and then it'll get brown, right? And then a little bit above, then it starts to get darker, black, and you don't want that, right? Yes. So I yes. think, you know, it's again, it's it's understanding these milestones. And again, it's essentially, again, it's not something new that we came up with. Uh, your grandmothers and so on always used visual cues. They didn't know Maillard reaction. They didn't know temperatures, but they used intuitive visual cues to figure out when something is done, right? They didn't say cook for 20 minutes or nobody says fry a puri for two minutes and the puri will be done. That's ridiculous. That's not how it works because it will vary based on your uh, oil you use, based on, you know, what's the temperature, based on all kinds of other conditions, right? So again, so that's the reason why understanding temperature is tremendously useful. Yeah, in fact, and I remember, uh, you know, telling in terms of uh, that Ose uh, Adangrath means, you know, that sound has to sort of subside before you take exactly. it out. Exactly, exactly, right? Away, exactly. And then once the noise reduces, then that's when yeah. it starts becoming brown and yeah. right. Exactly. So here's here's the perfect example of a heuristic that will perfectly work. Why? Because think about it. You will get the sound only when water is bubbling, right? And once the surface water is lost, you won't hear the sound. And so it's a perfect heuristic, right? The the people who came up with this may not understand it's because of dehydration and may, and all of that. They may not understand. But the heuristic right. still works, and it's a good heuristic, right? Unlike, say, the, the two whistles heuristic, which is based on a, a, a much more flawed understanding of how pressure cooker works. So another mm -hmm. fascinating thing that I've often observed, that the older the heuristic, the far more likely it is uh, to be more correct. Simple, mm -hmm. you know, sort of evolutionary mechanisms that knowledge that is sort of uh, memetically uh, transmitted and orally transmitted as opposed to written transmission has one advantage that if it applies to something practical, if it doesn't work, it won't get passed on. 
So if there was some trick about making a puri that resulted in failed puris, it would not have got passed on, right? So, so part of the often, you know, the 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 dilemma of dealing with say traditional knowledge and say scientific knowledge uh, is that it you can't have this extremist position that everything here is right and everything here is wrong, you know, in either way, right? Often the you have to sort of you know I think Nassim Nicholas Taleb also says that uh, uh, sometimes practical traditional wisdom has has passed the test of time. Okay. Um, yeah. But a poorly tested, poorly written, highly limited white paper with dubious data published in a journal may be bad science. Okay. So he says that, yeah, and sometimes people will trust that over traditional wisdom, which is problem, which is a problematic. The ideal way to do is to take that traditional wisdom, see if you can explain it in the language of science and be able to independently test and verify it. And then actually then that, you know, that traditional wisdom actually becomes, you know, scientifically validated wisdom, if you will. Right, right. Uh, I mean, speaking of puris and uh, deep frying, um, you know, uh, there was this uh, interesting concept of the science of autolysis that I was uh, reading. Um, like, yeah. you know, the, there's no need to knead the dough. Um, uh, like, I've seen my mom do that, but I never, I never understood why that. Like, you know, she she needs it or she mixes water with it and let it settle for 30 minutes. So uh, can you take us through the process of autolysis and uh, what exactly yeah. So essentially, so you know, sort of, uh, if you understand how uh, wheat is a very unique uh, uh, flow, right? A unique grain uh, because it's the only uh, grain, uh, only grass-based grain on the planet uh, that has this uh, these two proteins called glutenin and gliadin, right? Um, and they, when they combine in the presence of water, uh, they form a very stretchy, waterproof coating. So it's a it's a unique mm -hmm. thing, right? So your your rice or millet or you name anything else, right? They don't have uh, this thing. So, so wheat is just unique in the sense that because you're able to form this stretchy waterproof coating, uh, you can therefore introduce air inside the dough and then allow it to rise and not collapse, which you cannot do with rice or, or any other kind of flour, right? And so the whole history of bread um, is predicated on that. And again, uh, bread, because just cooking that wheat dough will result in something that's really chewy and hard and dense. And so if it has air bubbles, you know, then it is, it becomes delightful as bread because, you know, it's, it's now, it's got, it's got air bubbles and then the outside undergoes the bad reaction and so on. So one is obviously wheat. Uh, so to understand how glutenin and gliadin actually work, is that uh, the moment you add water to floor, uh, these proteins start to uncoil um, and start to form this stretchy, this thing by themselves. Okay. Now the act of actually kneading, what it is actually doing is aligning the gluten in such a way that you get a even sort of a thickness of that coating all over so that it can be structurally sound and so on. And by the way, which is why kneading is not optional when you make bread. Let's be absolutely certain mm -hmm. because a bread has to rise uh, and right. you cannot have, you can, autolysis will result in a very uneven, the gluten will be strong in some places and weak in other places. Mm -hmm. I think the reason I sort of say chapati and puri and all these other things is, is that one, uh, you don't actually want too much healthy gluten formation in a chapati at all. Okay. Because mm -hmm. why? You don't want the chapati to be chewy. You want it to be just the right amount of chewy uh, uh, while it's still being sort of, you know, it's still able to bite it without having to you know, tear it from your mouth. Right. So, mm -hmm. which is, uh, so, which also brings us to another point. In India, traditionally, the reason we have both maida and atta is for a very specific reason. Atta is made so that a lot of the gluten and starches are damaged ahead of time. Okay. So if you notice how atta is made as opposed to how maida is made, atta is actually made in what's called a chakki mill, which is like two giant right. stones and they sort of mm -hmm. grind them. And so that process is tremendously a, a, you know, high heat uh, and it actually damages about 15% of the gluten that is there in the uh, gluten proteins in the wheat are damaged. And this is very strategic. Uh, so it's not a nutritional damage. It's a very strategic damaging because atta is therefore ideal for chapatis. So it will not form great gluten structures anyway, right? So, uh, so in, if you understand why Atta is first and foremost designed to make a, a relatively weak gluten flat bread that is easy to eat, as opposed to a bread which actually has to rise and, and so on. So which you use okay. maida for bread and you use Atta for chapati. So if you know that, then you know that actually you don't need to knead at all, right? Because your intent is not to create strong gluten structures in the first place, right? So mm -hmm. you want the softest chapati, don't knead. Just let it autolyse, 
uh, and that's all you need. So you're letting it auto lease just so you have enough gluten so it's easy to roll out. Because if you don't have enough gluten, then you can't roll out. It'll break apart. If you have anyone tried to make aki roti or anything with a non-gluten flour, we'll realize that rolling is the tough part, right? Mm. So you just want enough gluten to roll it out. So let the autolysis uh, kind of do that. Same thing, in fact, with Puri, uh, uh, in fact, uh, we go one step further. One, we are using Atta, which already has gluten damage. Two, we use very little water so that you don't have too much gluten formation. And three, you use fats in the, in the dough. You, you add a, a couple of teaspoons oil. of oil, right? Mm -hmm. Oil actually shortens gluten strands, which is why a, a fat in, in, in UK when you make biscuits is called shortening. In fact, the, the term shortbread Right? right, is literally is is it, why it's so crisp and hard is because no gluten got formed because there's so much butter added to the to the floor that it shortens the gluten strand so you get a crisper texture when you bake and not chewy texture mm -hmm. uh, and so on. So your cookies in the US tend, uh, is, have a little bit more gluten formation so they're slightly more chewier. Shortbread on the other hand is a crisp. So, so biscuits are essentially bread with very little gluten formation. So that's the mm -hmm. that's the basic principle, right? So likewise in puri, adding fat will actually make it, uh, 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 will make the gluten uh, structures less. So you get a flakier texture, which is what you want. So which is why parathas also use a mix of water and say uh, yogurt. Uh, uh, mm. And in some cases, uh, like in, in the Pakistan, the Northwest side, they will add an egg to the naan uh, dough because again, the right. addition of fats uh, actually shortens the gluten strands to make it a sort of a softer product as well. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there, there's actually a myth saying that, you know, people who have arthritis or you know, any kind of an inflammatory disease, um, they usually tend to avoid gluten because it kind of uh, triggers their reaction. So, and uh, I've also heard because, you know, wheat is, again, one of the, you know, it's largely consumed. Uh, we immediately assume that, you know, that's, that's packed with gluten. And uh, but from what you said, it, it looks like uh, we, we do have... Um, and we do add uh, substances to reduce the amount of gluten and the whole process of not needing it is uh, minimizing uh, the, you know, the amount of gluten in cooked food. So uh, the only thing here is that I think uh, I often tell this when, uh, and often it's, it's, you know, people now ask me a lot of these questions about cooking. 50% of them end up being about nutrition. Um, and I always mm -hmm. disappoint them and say, please don't ask me questions about nutrition because right. nutrition is a, is a medical, uh, this thing, and I'm not a trained nutritionist. And, and importantly, please don't take advice on nutrition from anyone who's not a qualified nutritionist. nutritionist uh, right. And it's, I, you know, so, so you know, again, the, the uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb rule applies, right? What you eat, you're less likely to have any problems if you're eating traditional foods because they've been tested for two th thousands of years. So you'll be mm -hmm. okay. Uh, it's it's uh, given that so many people have eaten it, you know, uh, reproduced and been healthy and lived their lives and so on. I think you'll be okay, right? Uh, mm -hmm. New things, new things in your diet, etc. You want to look for scientific validation of whether they are healthy or not. That's where the the, the trickiness uh, comes in, right? Uh, we the the honest answer is. Uh, we understand more about brain science than we do about nutrition. And nutrition is a right. phenomenally evolving space, right? Mm -hmm. See, there are no new books about Newton's laws, but there is a new nutrition book literally every six months. Why? Yeah. Because the science isn't settled, right? It's only because the science isn't settled is that there is an opportunity for people to sort of come up with new fads and new, new misinformation all the time. And it's subject to a tremendous amount of misinformation. And again, because nutrition is so such a personal thing, right? Yes, there are people who have gluten allergies. Uh, mm -hmm. There are people who have celiac disease. There are people who have lactose intolerance uh, and so on. There are people who specifically have MSG allergies also. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the point is that uh, our experience of food is so deeply personal and our way of digesting is dependent on your uh, nurture and nature. It's genetic lottery, Larry, right? You know, while you are growing, one specific uh, series of infection or an allergy that you may have had may perhaps cause an allergy to some food forever, right? You know, peanut allergy happens, you know, to some people and so on. So it is, I think in that sense, my only thing to people is, uh, one, rather than look at whether gluten is good or bad, uh, it's better to kind of first and foremost understand the, the proportion of weight of which you're dealing with this, you know, uh, right? That makes a difference, right? So common example, now, people claim that Himalayan pink salt is phenomenally more nutritious than regular salt, right? Because in... It is 98% sodium chloride. That 2% apparently has 84 other minerals. A simple mm -hmm. chemist should be able to tell you 2% by weight of the salt, which incidentally itself is less than 2% by weight of the dish. 
Mm-hmm. So salt is typically between 1.5 to 2% for it to taste reasonably salted uh, for, for, for Indians at least. The West, uh, the, the threshold is a bit lower. Think about it. You are dealing with an absolutely insignificant amount of those minerals, nowhere enough to make any kind of... So the first this thing to think about is statistics. Okay? That right. uh, whether a quarter teaspoon of MSG is going to actually harm you when your body, by the way, is made of two kilograms of glutamates because glutamic acid is an amino acid. Uh, mm-hmm. which makes up the proteins in your body. You have 2 kg of uh, the equivalent of MSG in your body. A quarter teaspoon is not going to make any difference, right? So right. one is the statistical part of it. The second part of it is also sort of uh, uh, the larger principle of what Michael Pollan says is that, you know, the only universal nutrition principle is everything else will constantly keep changing, but this is universal. He said, eat food, right? Food meaning that it cannot come out of a packet, right? Food is something that either has to grow from the land or or something that you know uh, that is meat from an animal that is eaten, whatever grows on the land. So that is food, okay? Uh, mostly plants, meaning that the less meat you eat, the better, uh, because it's more sustainable for the planet and it's also good for your body. So more, mostly plants, eat food, mostly plants, not too much. Basically saying eat less. There is nothing mm-hmm. better uh, than uh, to your, for your health than just simply eating less as less as you possibly can, right? Metabolism is literally the single largest contributor to aging and to bodily damage, right? Because it's the only foreign substance you put in two times a day and your body spends 60% of its, all of its calories just digesting what you put in, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, The remain is brain function and so on. And so we are therefore, the less you make it do, the better. I mean, in fact, if you see uh, people who fast and so on, they look yeah. tremendously young. They look tremendously fresh uh, and so on, right? Very little body fat and so on. So again, eat less. So all other things, whether un- whether unsaturated fat is good, saturated fat is good, whether ghee is yes. healthy, olive oil is healthy, gluten is good, gluten is bad, peanuts are good, peanuts are bad. All of that stuff will keep changing all the time. And as long mm-hmm. as you're understanding the statistics and eating little of it once in a while, and it's not something you eat three times a day, uh, you right. know, most people will be okay. So yeah, anything in moderation is is not harmful at all, yeah. right? Yeah, and everything everything that you eat too much of art, too much of is definitely harmful. So right. that yeah. applies to sugar, applies to rice, applies to you know literally anything. Yeah, anything. Um, and yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Initial thought, I mean, thoughts that you shared. Uh, you said you learned uh, the violin, and then uh, then you also learned. You know, you were a student of electrical engineering, and then now you're writing a you've written a book on food science. So when I look at my own journey in terms of, you know, I, I learned the violin too, of course, the Carnatic music as well. And then I've been a computer scientist for some time. And now I'm also looking at starting a traditional school here, which uh, which is to do with uh, like a gurukulam, you know, where personal yeah. learning can happen. So in that sense, when I look at it, uh, you know, I'm not sure if somebody wrote me a book in terms of, you know, you can play the violin by hitting like say 256 hertz or, uh, you know, uh, you, whatever it is, you know, you tune it to this uh, frequency and you place your finger on this particular frequency and then you would generate a note and that is sir or whatever it is. So, so how do we resolve this in terms of, you know, I, I clearly remember I sat with my, you know, violin guru and then hours and hours of uh, practicing. It's not just the practice, but you also imbibe so right, many things. Yeah. Of course, uh, what you say is not in contradiction. The science is, of course, yeah. not in yeah. But I'm saying in terms of, you know, uh, abstracting away uh, the uh, the essence of it by bringing it out as a science uh, versus, uh, you know, s- sitting in close quarters and imbibing uh, the things uh, intuitively. So, yeah, Absolutely. No, and I, I think that I, I incomplete agreement with you. So in fact, actually, I, I'm not saying. So first and foremost, um, there is nothing better than being apprenticed and learning from someone who's who's sort of imparting the knowledge directly so there's nothing there's nothing better than that right so one so we are essentially kind of uh, the reason we write down things and use science and all of that is because uh, everyone on the planet cannot have that relationship it, it's not it's not scalable right so right. a teacher can truly do justice only to maybe a small single digit number of students uh, and the, the number of students the ratio of number of students to teachers is almost going to always be you know a thousand ten thousand two one so it, it, there are always going to be a shortage of personal teaching ability and the reason we write down and we publish and we sort of create textbooks and all of that is because we the second best thing is okay if i'm going to write down this knowledge i might as well make it in a way that uh, someone who's only reading by reading a book 
or in a in a not a great school with uh, you know a great teacher and so on can still learn so that's the intent of you know the purpose of knowledge representation right and so that, which is why i said that you know in the context of cooking also i'm like you know i don't think people need to understand what what molecules are being created and that why does garlic smell the way it does and you know whether it is a uh, uh, allyl bar captain or ethyl bar captain and all of that is is not is is not relevant right uh, so there is a, therefore uh, uh, the idea is what limited amount of applied science is useful for you to understand what you're doing right uh, and so likewise in the music example as well right so uh, as a you know as someone who's also learned violin so i often found that uh, the number of students who drop off after in carnatic music the you know the the, the geetam stage if you will right mm-hmm. is huge i think 90% of people <laughs> drop off uh, yeah. and i and i don't think it's their fault uh, i think it's it's the teaching methods fault right because there is literally no gradual step from getting past geetam into the into the slightly more serious uh, ways of actually performing yes i know there are varnams and so on but that jump from that to kirtanams to improvisation to alapana etc is just too high for most students to actually pick and what i find is that if in in other classical forms uh, be it jazz be it uh, you know uh, in western classical and so on uh, the, the, there is the, the steps are really really small and they have a ton of steps right uh, and so in, that's the thing right so it's likewise with indian cooking um, i think the bar for getting good at it becomes very difficult in the absence of uh, uh, say basic user manuals uh, that explain the basics of what it is and it doesn't have to get down look in, in when i'm learning music i don't have to get to the level of hertz at all yes yes, yes. right but i what i do what i do want to do is that i want like i'll give you an example even within india itself i find hindustani music has a longer apprenticeship and initial learning period and a longer curve for doing basic things uh, so for example if you say alangaram or something like that we have only like a limited finite number okay hindustani music has like 100 times the amount of alangarams that we do and so you end up doing those basics for a much longer time right um, and they progressively get uh, more more complex so it's not like we don't have it in india at all you you look for it and you'll find that there are you know uh, ways of teaching uh, that have actually imbibed this and again it's not surprising because i think hindustani music is a little bit more democratized in terms of the the number of people who learn it uh, across communities across religions uh, in, in a wider area of geography uh, compared to say carnatic music and so on so in that sense uh, i think that's the that's the distinction that we have to make the right amount of applied science uh, only to be able to document the craft uh, in a more accurate manner that somebody two generations from now can still learn something without losing the fidelity of what uh, an expert uh, was we are talking about maybe a century or so ago is really the intent right so i think yeah, i'm i'm in agreement with you i think nothing better than actually learning from a person but most people can't do it so i think that's the that's the Oh, yeah you know as i said uh, you know what you say is not in contradiction but definitely helps yep. to sort of uh, elaborate Absolutely. and put Absolutely. it Absolutely. i think it is it is important to recognize uh, that yeah. yeah um getting back to food again uh, you know the science of vegetables again um um you, you you spoke about how cutting vegetables is an art and i'm terrible at it like i can cook but i can i cannot cut vegetables for a living um and uh, when I, i was reading about how the cellular structures and how it helps us in you know cooking faster or especially in retaining nutri- nutrients um yeah. what like what what is a good way to cut and second question um you know in relation to uh, vegetables when we steam or when we boil vegetables we lose a lot of nutrients um uh, and with the water and we throw away the water um yeah. is there a way we can minimize that uh, like what can we do when cooking vegetables uh, when sure. when we add water to it so a lot of very counterintuitive things about vegetables is that you know right. uh, vegetables uh, vegetables cook at a higher temperature than meat okay so almost 20 mm-hmm. celsius higher than meat so that's what so people are almost always think that uh, meat is harder to cook actually meat cooks faster uh, and quicker at a lower temperature mm-hmm. uh, and the second thing is that uh vegetables come in a an infinite variety of textures and structures right um so root vegetables are are a, are a completely different thing they're mostly starch right? right root vegetables are you know mostly 80 90% starch barring the water i mean it's water. it's mostly starch mm-hmm. right uh and within those root vegetables some like potato have a good amount of protein uh but your yams and your tapioca you know uh, elephant foot yam your chennai and all of that and colocasia mm-hmm. 
right? Uh, and all of those don't have much protein. Okay. Uh, and so yeah. the reason I'm saying all of this is that it's it's good to be a little bit curious about uh, what goes into the vegetable and what its structure is and where it came from, because your ability to then decide what cutting technique I use uh, will be better informed, right? So there's root vegetables. Um, and then you basically have the very high water gourd vegetables, right? which are mostly water, cucumber, uh, you know, uh, snake gourd, pumpkins, pumpkins mm. uh, uh, all the rest of those melon and cucurbite family. Then you have the solanase, which is all your tomatoes, chilies. Uh, incidentally, potatoes and chilies and tomatoes are from the same family of plants. Uh, mm -hmm. This is the potatoes in the root part, uh, and then the then the fruits are basically your chilies or tomatoes or brinjal. They're all the same family, and this entire family of plants is called nightshade. Um, and mm -hmm. the vast majority of nightshade plants, the leaves are poisonous. It's called the deadly nightshade. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, that's why tomato leaves are actually slightly poisonous. Uh, um, and in fact, mantakali kire is one of those that is very mildly poisonous. Just that the mild level useful enough for it to be a painkiller and healthy for you, right? So if for most things, right, you know, so there's a very fine distinction between what is a poison and what is a drug, okay? Most right. drugs are actually concentrated poisons, right? So that, I mean, or drugs are diluted poisons for most part, okay? Uh, and so, you know, uh, mantakali kire is a very mild, uh, has that same alkaloid, which in large quantities will kill you, right? But in mild quantities, it's, it's sort of good for you, right? Uh, so, so the point is that uh, each of this, you have all of these other vegetables. Now, then you have what we call uh, spice of flavor heavy vegetables, right? See, your, 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 uh, your brinjal and uh, your potato, et cetera, are not high flavor vegetables, right? In the sense that you have to add flavor to them uh, uh, for, so that they, you know, et cetera. So the category of things that we call spices, right? And herbs right. And, and so on, they're all the category of things that have uh, a ton of flavor molecules. And why do they have these flavor molecules? Only we call them flavor molecules because they exist so that to prevent animals from eating them, right? They're all nasty mm -hmm. chemicals that animals cannot tolerate. So the more flavorful something is, is that it is it is defending itself from a cow or a goat grazing on it. Okay, That's literally what the uh, role of a spice essentially is. Your onion has all those sulfur molecules simply because it does not want a cow to eat. Um, uh, garlic is the same thing. Uh, every chili is the same thing. Um, and fascinatingly enough, it has evolved in such a way that birds do not have that uh, capsaicin sensor. So the chili plant actually wants the bird to pollinate. So that's why it's 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 sort of evolved uh, that way. And so it's, you know, and, right? So that's, a, so understanding all of this, likewise, for example, understanding where the hot part of the chili is. People yeah. think it's the seed, it's not. It's the, it's the placenta, it's the hot part. But normally, again, when you cut a chili and you kind of just remove all the seeds, you're removing the placenta along with it. So you kind of think that, okay, you're removing the heat. The seeds are just bitter. And, and if you, if you know, capsicum, which is why we sort of remove the uh, seed. But the, you know, in a capsicum is essentially a chili with uh, no heat in the placenta. That's basically what it is, right? Um, right. And so therefore, if you kind of understand these broad heuristics, so now based on what you want to do, especially for spices, herbs, and those kinds of things like a ginger, garlic, onion, et cetera, et cetera, how you cut it uh, will determine the amount of flavor a lot more than how you cut a potato or how you cut a, a brinjal and so on, right? Uh, because what happens is that uh, uh, first and foremost, cutting is cooking, by the way. Cooking doesn't start when you put it in the pan. Cooking starts when you cut, okay? In many cases, cooking starts when you pluck the thing from the, uh, from the plant itself. Why? Because enzymes are there in the plant that get activated the moment there is any mechanical damage. So the right. moment there is cellular damage, Enzymes get activated, they immediately oxidize the whole thing. So if you cut, uh, if you cut say brinjal or potatoes, they'll immediately start turning brown, right? So it's an mm -hmm. enzymatic activity. So that's why you have to dip it in water. So you don't expose them to air, right? So that's the, mm -hmm. so that's the reason why we sort of cut vegetables and put them in water, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the other thing is that in the context of garlic or onions, the larger you cut size, the less cells you damage. And so the less flavor you will get in the dish. Mm -hmm. okay? The more you cut, the smaller you cut, and if you mince, you get the most amount of flavor. Again, this is a this is again an aesthetic choice, right? If you want a mild garlic flavor, you want to use it whole. That may be what you want to do, right? If you're making like garlic rasam, uh, people will use the whole clove because you don't want it to overpower, right? right. Uh, but if you're making like uh, something that is uh, a lot more intense, then you want to mince it or chop it uh, either which way. Likewise, an onion, depending on whether you're cutting from root to bulb or across. Uh, root to bulb, you'll damage fewer uh, onion cells, and therefore it'll be less sort of oniony, if you will. But if you cut a transverse, it's going to be much stronger, uh, and so on. Right. So this is, in some sense, I think you know your your cutting strategy has to be informed by one, 
uh, what flavor do you ultimately want in your dish? Uh, and, and also the simple physics of the surface area itself, right? So for example, if you cut a vegetable into smaller pieces, uh, there is more surface area. More surface area means more of the surface area will get dehydrated as you cook it in oil. Um, and so it'll get a res result in a crisper uh, output, right? So, you know, you could cut the potato really, really small and it gets much, much crisper versus a larger yeah. piece, which will get crisp only on the outside, uh, but the insides uh, will stay soft and so on. And likewise, the distinction between say a potato and say a yam or a chene, um, is that uh, a colocasia, which is uh, you know, uh, does, not, uh, does not have enough protein at all. So mm -hmm. for it to get brown, to, for it, the Bayard reaction to be really effective, you have to add some kind of protein. Uh, so usually we will add basin or gram flour, which has protein. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, whereas you don't need to do that with potato because it has enough protein. So for Bayard reaction to happen, you need amino acids and you need sugars, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So chene, for instance, will crisp up you know, pretty neatly. But interestingly, if the color of the chene is already brown, so it's not, it doesn't have enough protein, but you still think it is actually getting the Bayard reaction, it's not, it's simply dehydrating, right? So it's because it looks brown, you're thinking it's actually browning, it's not, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So if you actually want, uh, if you add a little bit of basin when you're making chene, it actually results in a much, much uh, more interesting taste um, as well. So this is something mm. that I've discovered. Likewise, uh, Chepanganga, Arbi, uh, or uh, Colocasia, you have to add some kind of uh, a floor that okay. has some protein, right? Um, mm. And for potatoes, you don't need to do that, right? So this is this is really, really good stuff. Um, and uh, coming to marination, um, again, um, it was interesting to note that, you know, you don't need to marinate for hours. So if you could tell us, um, you know, what is an, what's a good time to marinate and, uh, right. or, you know, the use of brine solution instead, like you yes. mentioned in the book, yes. if you could tell us about that. So funnily enough, you know, just, just consider the word marination, right? So forget, you know, forget what it means today, right? The word mm -hmm. marination literally means soak in seawater. Yeah. It's the, you oh, know, the, the marine, okay. right? Yeah, yeah. So marine, marine. so marination yeah. is literally soak in seawater, right? So the traditional idea of how people used to do this is to soak meat in, uh, in sea water, right? Uh, but that's exactly what they would do. Um, well, clearly, uh, for multiple reasons, uh, the salt, uh, pre-refrigeration, uh, salt is a preservative. Uh, and the second thing is that the salt is the only thing that penetrates in into the yeah. meat uh, or into anything for that matter. Um, and uh, therefore, anything with salt in it will taste better. I mean, it's just more seasoned, right? So there is, a, so there is that reason, right? Now, uh, specifically in India, and again, this is more of a North Indian thing because by the way, South India, we don't marinate, by the way. Uh, it's not, marination mm -hmm. is, uh, if if anything, we actually use the correct one. So this is just often I, I keep telling North Indians that, you know, hey, South Indians are more scientific when it comes to how we cook meat. But although you guys think that you, you do 20,000 spices in your marinade using yogurt and all those other things. So a traditional sort of your... Uh, uh, this is North, uh, when I say North Indian, it's literally a, the belt Anything from Iran than to Afghanistan. No, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, you know, North okay. India, right? So that entire mm -hmm. stretch. Uh, so what they do is that they essentially use uh, yogurt as, a, right. as an acid, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because yogurt is, is acidic, it's sour, right? right. Uh, and yogurt also has fat. So it's an ideal combination, mm -hmm. right? Into that yogurt, you're going to add spices. You're going to add ginger, garlic. You're going to add um, uh, powdered spices, garam masala, dhania powder, jeera powder, you know, turmeric, and chili powder, and all that stuff. Right? right. So the goal of a marinade in that situation is for the acid to denature the proteins on the surface of the meat. Right. Uh, so acid denatures proteins. So denaturing essentially means proteins are three-dimensional structures. Denature essentially means they lose their three-dimensional structure. Right. Uh, and they uh, so that uh, allows for uh, the fats uh, to dissolve the spice flavors and then stick to the surface uh, more easily. Uh, otherwise, it won't stick. So because yeah, again, as animals, all of us have a vested interest in preventing things from sticking to us, right? So it's a natural thing. So uh, we have mechanisms to make sure that things don't stick to us. So it's, it's the same thing. So we use an acid and we use uh, a combination of acid and fat to get spices to stick to the surface of the meat. But historically, people have begun to think that the longer they leave it, that the flavor goes inside more and so on. And this is the misconception. It does not. There are no, actually, there's a, there's a, I, I can share the link to a YouTube a video that literally does a half an hour marinade and a, you know, 72 hour marinade and shows that, and, and they use a, a, so a dye that is very visible in ultraviolet light and so on. Uh, you can literally see that the marinade barely penetrates one cell or two cells deep. That's it. 
it can it does not go inside a tort salt on the other hand is what actually goes um, inside right um, and so this is the this thing so the you know what i tell people is that you do marination because it's a good way to actually get flavors to stick to the surface and then at the end of the day you cook it and you know uh, you can make it ahead of time and then where you can rapidly cook it uh, all all of those things are there but uh, there is no distinction between a half an hour marination and a 72 hour for 24 hour 48 hour marination it does nothing at all right Mm. Um, and if your marinade is very acidic, like you squeeze lime juice, you choose vinegar and all that, it will it will spoil the texture because it will denature too much of the surface and it will get a very mealy texture, which is not nice at all. Uh, so in general, uh, there is no difference between a half an hour marinade and a 72 hour marinade. Brining, on the mm. other hand, if you do brine before the, the marination, it makes a big difference because the salt actually gets into uh, the meat and it also prevents it from losing any further moisture. Uh, and this is also very intuitive if you think about it. If you exercise and you get dehydrated, uh, you drink you know, water with sugar, with salt. Right. The salt is crucial because the reason we drink the salt is that the salt will prevent muscles in our body from losing moisture to perspiration because mm -hmm. you don't want to get dehydrated. So salt right. is crucial to prevent dehydration. And this is very counterintuitive. Adding salt to plant material dehydrates plants. Like you take cucumber and or tomato and you drop some salt, it will lose a lot of water, right? Because mm -hmm. salt dehydrates plant tissue, it hydrates animal tissue. So this is a very counterintuitive uh, sort of this thing. And that's the reason why we brine, right? So animal tissue actually retains moisture. And so you can cook it for a longer time. It won't get dry. So that's the reason why. Uh, and it, 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 the salt is inside, so it'll actually taste better. The second thing is, is people also have this misconception that you can marinate vegetables. Uh, you cannot. Okay, because uh, the the proteins on the surface of plant material, uh, they there are not enough proteins for most part, and they're actually made of something called pectin. Okay. Pectin is mm -hmm. tremendously hard to break down okay, in general, and to get anything to stick, um, even if it's like paneer, right, uh, and so on, you need a starch binder. Which is why the distinction between a paneer tikka and a meat based tikka is that the marinade will also have gram flour. It'll have like basin. Right. So the basin actually will create that sticky starch thing that will stick to the, the paneer. Otherwise, it won't, your marinade won't stick uh, to the paneer at all. And in any case, it's not penetrating. So no question about that in any case, right? So which is why when you're, so the problem is that other vegetables, you can't marinate because salt will dehydrate them. Mm. So you can't brine or uh, this thing unless you want to dehydrate the whole thing, right? So, right. so therefore, I think so that's the, the, the tricky thing uh, with, with at least marination and so on. So, but we do, uh, like, I, I know, uh, you know, we have this, uh, uh, we call the, what, do you, what do you call that? The, the chilies that you, uh, you know, soak it in uh, right. yogurt and yeah. then sun dry them. And, yes, um, yes. More yeah, absolutely. So, right. so there. More more yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So the, there you are actually wanting to do exactly that. Uh, the, the other thing is that the soaking in salt also uh, basically essentially removes the heat uh, a fair bit. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it actually sort of deactivates a fair bit of that capsaicin. Um, and that is one of the reasons because salt actually gets it. Uh, and so right. you're able to sort of, you know, reduce the heat. Otherwise it would be too hot to eat and so on. Right. So that's mm -hmm. also the reason we do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, coming to, um, oh yeah, uh, the, the fats. Um, I wanted to understand uh, what is the effect of uh, unrefined or the virgin oils that we talk about. Um, so what, what, what is the difference between um, unrefined virgin and refined and uh, how and when do we use them? Like, I know there are a few foods yeah. where you use unrefined virgin oils yeah. and yeah. Um, where do, where, when do we use uh, virgin yeah. and um, you know, unrefined oils? Right. So, you know, again, you know, sort of a first principles way of thinking about this is that uh, all oils, all fats uh, mm -hmm. are, are essentially made of uh, fatty acids, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And the way these fatty acids are, you take sort of three fatty acids, they attach them to this molecule called glycerol. So that's why they're called triglycerides. So the, all the fats right. that we eat, all oils are triglycerides, right? Uh, so mm -hmm. there's this glycerol molecule and this, so you have these you know, fat, uh, fatty acids. Uh, different combinations of fatty acids result in different sort of oils uh, that we get and so on, right? Now, these fatty acids, uh, if they have carbon double bonds, then they're considered to be unsaturated in the sense that, so saturated meaning that they only have single bonds means they have the largest amount of hydrogen, okay, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because a single bond of carbon means that it can attach itself to four hydrogen molecules or you know, in a long chain, at least three, right? Uh, the moment you have a carbon double bond, uh, 
you can only have like two uh, your triple bond you can only have like one and so on right uh, so the lesser the amount of hydrogen attached to these fatty acids uh, the more unsaturated they are so your essentially con con concept is saturation with hydrogen that's the terminology which is also why uh, we talk about hydrogenated oil which is your vanaspati dalda and all of that right mm -hmm. so hydrogenation is artificially forcing hydrogen uh, so that you take all of these double bonds and turn them into single bonds so that's how you okay. take a vegetable oil um, and saturate it um, and you create create data now again so in the context of fats what happens is that the more double bonds you have in your in your uh, in your in your fats those fats are likely to be liquid at room temperature mm. right uh, you know uh, look, uh, any kind of sunflower oil or whatever cooking it is oil. liquid at room yeah. temperature right cooking any kind of cooking oil the more saturated they are those saturated fats uh, tend to be solids at room temperature right mm. e everything from ghee and uh, i know we are in chennai and we because of our high room temperature we think ghee is liquid but ghee is solid everywhere else in the world okay right coconut right. oil is solid everywhere else in the world right at yes. at uh, 18 celsius it's solid right uh, and so on and uh, butter is is solid at room temperature in most places so these are all saturated fats so this is one important distinction right now uh, refined and unrefined has essentially to do with a couple of things right now when you extract the oil from say a mustard from groundnut from peanut from whatever the process of extraction does not always result in oil that is completely properly where if it's all there is a triglyceride and everything is neatly fixed etc you're going to have some fatty acids freely roaming around unattached okay now it has two things okay free fatty acids uh actually smell have a strong aroma but the moment they attach themselves to in a triglyceride format they they become completely bland uh, and they, they they don't actually have that strong aroma right uh, so this is this is one thing to remember right so when you when you actually process oil when you extract the oil you're going to naturally have a ton of things okay so you're going to have free fatty acids you're going to have triglycerides and you're going to have ton of other molecules that you simply squeezed out of the plant uh, that are not fats at all that are there in the oil because the process of crushing ended up infusing a lot of those things into all these things now so here is where the refining process comes the refining process is essentially the process of removing anything that is not a triglyceride from the oil why do we do that right now because the unrefined oil will actually be more aromatic simply because it has a ton of things right? okay right. Uh, but if it has many things that are not fats and it has free fatty acids and so on one it has a smaller shelf life right it will go rancid a, a lot more commonly uh, more quickly and the second thing is that you cannot heat it to very high temperatures you can't deep fry anything okay? mm. so it's called something called the smoke point so if you if you heat an oil uh, typically like a refined sunflower oil will start smoking only at 200 celsius right and so you can safely deep fry a puri at 170 and nothing will happen mm. a virgin or a, a unrefined oil uh, will smoke at 130 or 140 right oh, okay. and at 170 your all that those fats your oil is already starting to break down uh, and mm -hmm. it, it won't taste very good right so which is why you should not deep fry in in an unrefined uh, oil right with the exception the some of the exceptions is obviously ghee has a very high smoke point right you don't have to refine it because it's mostly saturated already okay so the problem of refining uh as also essentially comes only in plant based oils not in animal fats and because mm -hmm. ghee is animal fat uh, you don't have this problem right so likewise an actually uh, sort of you know uh, there's there is a uh, nay uh, you know in fact the tamil the original tamil word nay actually refers to all animal fats not just the mm -hmm. fat that you get from milk also the actual fat in the animal itself is also called nay right mm -hmm. so uh, and so on. so so in any case so those fats are naturally ideal for deep frying in the past right whereas plant sources of fats will smoke unless you refine them and refinement is a process that we've discovered only in the last you know ever since the industrial revolution and so on mm -hmm. so refining is literally the removal of anything that's not fat and so on the other process to remember is that there was a movement in the between the 1960s and basically the earlier part of the previous century uh, to to take plant fats and to say that you know what uh liquids are harder to transport okay uh, supply chain wise right liquids are mess i mean it, they slosh about they're harder to transport solids are easy to transport so can i convert all these fats to solids 
So that's why we introduced a process called hydrogenation by forcing all those double bonds into single bonds and sort of turn them into solids. So you take a palm oil, which is liquid okay, uh, from the palm tree, right? Typically in Indonesia, Malaysia, and then you hydrogenate it. It turns into dalda, vanaspati, which is your, which is solid, right? Likewise, you can take other plant sources of oil and turn them into margarine. Uh, any solid hydrogenated sort of vegetable oils are all uh, uh, solid at room temperature, but they've become less popular now uh, because the process of hydrogenation ends up uh, creating what we call, uh, occasionally, so the interesting thing is that, uh, so all molecules, since because they have three-dimensional structures, they have orientation. So there's an L orientation and a R orientation. Right? So there is a R dextrose mm. and a L dextrose and so on, right? Depending on, you know, which side that bond may be and so on. And by the way, for our body, that orientation matters. If the molecule is the wrong orientation, it will not fit into the appropriate receptors if the orientation is wrong, right? So there is a distinction. In fact, in coriander, uh, there is literally a distinction between the flavor coming that, that comes from the, the right-oriented version of that aldehyde versus the left-oriented version of the aldehyde and so on, right? So the, the, the difference is huge, although they're the same molecule and so on. So the process of hydrogenation, apparently what it used to do is to introduce uh, a greater percentage of the left-oriented, uh, L-oriented uh, uh, versions of those molecules, right? And some of those are very bad for your heart, right? So you have cis isomers of that and trans isomers of that. Yes. And the trans isomers are actually bad for you, which is what medical science has discovered over time. And then we said, okay, maybe we should not hydrogenate and just mm -hmm. eat the vegetable plant oils as they are, right? So that's where the whole trans fats problem comes in, right? Yeah. It comes literally from, and why? Why? Because it's cheap. Plant sources of fats are cheap. Animal sources of fats are expensive, right? Because, yeah. you know, plants are, you know, you grow them everywhere and so on. So, so this is one. So therefore, in the context of our day-to-day -day use, uh, if you're deep frying, you must use a refined oil. There is just no two ways about it. Please do not use unrefined oils. But for your day-to-day -day sauteing, you know, regular use of oil just to get spices into it and so on, use an unrefined oil uh, because it is it is definitely going to be healthier uh, right. on the longer run. Uh, and so that's the general idea. As for whether you should use olive oil, uh, and then there is the other one, right? Depending on where the the, the double bond is from the end of the the fatty acid, uh, if it is if it is three. Uh, molecules away from the end, it is omega minus three. It's by the way, omega minus, it's not omega hyphen, right? It's omega three, it's actually omega minus three. Omega, three. Mm -hmm. so omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. So it's omega minus right. three essentially means third position from the last. So if the double bond is in the third position from the last, it's an omega three, omega minus three or omega minus six. Um, mm -hmm. And there is some evidence that, you know, some fish oils and certain kinds of uh, oils right. have a greater proportion of that and may be good for you and so on. But again, again, the statistics of, you know, how much you eat and all of that applies, right? At the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So general principle Principle is use refined oil for deep frying and use uh, use essentially uh, some kind of Wonderful. unrefined uh, oil for plant-based oil for your day-to-day -day cooking, and use animal fats for special occasions for flavor. Okay. Right, so because you you can't you can't get the taste of a butter or a ghee uh, from a plant-based source of fat. Uh, right. Those things just have a specific flavor profile that you simply cannot replicate. And, and again, in, in a global sense, uh, this applies to uh, schmaltz, which is chicken fat, or if it applies to tallow, which is beef fat, or pork lard, right? So all mm -hmm. of these sources of fats are tremendously flavorful, not good for your heart. Uh, and in fact, actually, beef and uh, pork fat actually have a high proportion of uh, trans fats naturally, by the way. Uh, and so oh, if you're okay. only eating a diet only on that, you you, you will have, you know, there's a higher likelihood of heart problems. Uh, well, so. so therefore, right. yeah. Uh, so I think it is it is it is essentially that. So don't overthink it. And what I would say is just you know this is what you should use. Right. 